I hope you're having as good a time as we are. What an extraordinary set of talks already, and we're just getting started. So remember this afternoon, uh, there will be the statue unveiling on the lawn, uh, the new plaza of the uh, Stark County Courthouse this evening, this extraordinary symphony uh, written by Chris Brubeck, the son of the great jazz musician Dave Brubeck. Chris Brubeck has previously done historically based symphonic pieces on Iwo Jima, on Ansel Adams, and on Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. We commissioned him to write this piece on Theodore Roosevelt from the Badlands years. Its world premiere was last week, Saturday night in Bismarck, and it was an extraordinary experience, and you're absolutely going to love it. So if you, if you, if you weren't planning to come, do plan to come. We expect a packed house here tonight in this very space. Um, but now let me move on, and we will, we will not ask um, Ted White to, to um, reduce his talk at all. We'll just um, get back on schedule during the noon hour. As Elliot West said last night, this is one of those books that changes the way you think about some really important things, the Eastern establishment and the Western experience. I'm going to read uh, the last passage from it here in just a moment. You have a long biography of uh, G. Edward White in your uh, brochure. I won't go through all of it, but I, it's fair to say that he's written a slew of books, 14 already. Uh, this one, 1968. Uh, he's Harvard and Yale educated. Uh, he's the David and Mary Harrison Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. He, clucked, uh, he clerked for Earl Warren. I mean, it, it's an amazing uh, biography of accomplishments in a range of fields. And Roosevelt, uh, Remington, and Worcester is just one area of his immense erudition. Um, I remember reading this book about five or six years ago and thinking this should be a foundation book for anyone who's doing anything involving Roosevelt or, or anyone interested in the, in, the, in the origins of the mythos of the cowboy and the American West and the, the open range. Here's a passage, the last passage in the book from page 202. It was the Roosevelt generation that first called attention to a dilemma in American culture which is still present. How to come to terms with metropolitan living while demonstrating the relevancy of alternative existences. The search for freedom from a corporate and technological world still manifests itself in the arena of national politics as when in the flush of Barry Goldwater's triumph in 1964, pride-filled delegates rose to denounce the Eastern establishment whose yoke they had momentarily cast off. Perhaps Perhaps such attempts to resist the tide of corporate professionalism are as fallacious as earlier desires to implant the yeoman farmer in the midst of technocratic America. It takes you right back to last night. Um, but they represent the same reluctance on the part of Americans to wholly embrace an urban and industrial society without positing alternatives to it. Perfect, perfect analysis. G. Edward White, please welcome. Thank you, Clay, and it's nice to be here, and, and I should say it's a little an unusual experience for me, um, because although my father was born in Minot, North Dakota, um, this is the first time I've been in the state. Uh, and and uh, he ended up um, living in New England and in New York, where I grew up. And uh, I only came to write the Eastern Establishment because uh, as a graduate student in American Studies at Yale, uh, I wanted to write a biography of Owen Wister, whose papers had just um, been released and were available at the Library of Congress. And so I consulted people in the American Studies Department and was told pointedly that graduate students didn't do biographies. Um, at, at, at that point, I, um, one of the people that was um, important to me as a graduate student was Howard Lamar, the, the famous Western historian, and uh, he suggested that I might be able to integrate my interest in Worcester in a, in a work on the American West because he had noted that um, in addition to Worcester, Theodore Roosevelt had grown up in the East and, and gone out to the West at the, at the same time. So um, I went ahead, I discovered that Frederick Remington 
although mainly known as an artist, had um, also done some writings on the West, so I decided to go ahead and write the dissertation. Uh, having done that, I thought, well, gosh, you know, I, I really um, don't see myself as a, a Western historian, and so maybe I ought to try to find something else to do. Um, so I went to law school. Uh, <laughs> Uh, talk about not resisting the tide of corporate professionalism. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then found my way back into, into legal academics and really haven't done any writing on Western history since. Um, I wrote a preface when the Eastern Establishment was reissued in 1987, but that was just a, a way of thanking Howard Lamar, um, and I didn't really add it. And I'm, I, painfully aware on, on preparing for this talk uh, of how much has gone on and how much I uh, failed to take into account when I was writing the Eastern Establishment. Um, but I, I do agree with um, much of what Elliot West said last night, that if we broaden the lens, we can see Roosevelt's expedition to the Badlands uh, and the ramifications of it for thinking about the figure of the cowboy in American culture, we, we can see that um, perhaps in a different way. So what I want to do th this morning is to, is to put three questions and see if we can explore them. The, the first question is, why was cowboy life depicted by the principal persons who wrote about it in the way it was? Why was, it, why was the representation of the cowboy so inaccurate in so many respects? And why, was cowboy, why were cowboys chosen uh, to be heroic figures when so much of their lives were, were um, much more mundane? Um, secondly, why did it take nearly a decade, perhaps even over a decade, from when ranching first got established in the, in the years right after the Civil War for this myth, of, as I'm putting it, uh, of, the, of the cowboy to appear in, in popular consciousness? And why was the myth fashioned not by contemporaries contemporary residents of the ranching areas, but by persons who lived in the East, who journeyed out, who experienced uh, some intermittent excursions in the West, Roosevelt being one of those, and then who went back to the East and beginning in the 1880s developed this myth. Um, why didn't it happen Right away, why, did, why were the people fashioning it not um, actually residents, full-time residents of the, of the West? Um, and then finally, and, and Elliot uh, alluded to this last night as well, finally, wh why does the idea of a Western featuring cowboys, featuring stock figures, the occasional lawman, the saloon keeper, the desperado, um, the, the, the vigilante, the, the Native Americans in the background. Um, why does that Western, as we think of it, um, why has that emerged as an important genre in American life when we can't say the same thing comparably about any other region? If, if I, if I um, employ the term Western, it has, it has recognition in both, in both um, books and films. If I say the term Eastern, meaning a genre, or Southern, or Northern, um, we're hard pressed. There may be representative novels or films of those regions, but we can't think of anything stock. Why is it then that the Western has, has occupied this central place? Well, let, let, let's take them in order. First, the, the 
mythical representation of the cowboy portrays him, of course he, he's a male figure, um, as independent, self-reliant, um, and somehow uh, acquiring a, a virtue from being apart from civilization, casting off the trappings of civilization and, and occupying uh, a more independent space. Um, secondly, that the cowboy is a, a self-sufficient figure, living off the land, foraging for himself. Um, finally, that he has his own codes of law and justice, which transcend the sort of more formal codes of civilization. So on the range one settles things man to man. Um, and somehow the settlement is, uh, is virtuous. If you look at the Virginian, uh, a best-selling novel published by Owen Wister, a classmate of Roosevelt's at Harvard in 1903, the, the, the figure of the Virginian embodies all of these sorts of virtues. And, and if you look at High Noon, the movie that is an adaptation of the Virginian, the Gary P Cooper figure is, is comparable. Well, so much is left out in this portrait. I indeed, almost everything important, arguably, about ranch life is left out. Um, now, to understand that, let's back up a little bit and, and consider how ranching actually got started. It is, as Elliot said last night, it is a product of the years after the United States acquires a huge amount of territory in not just the Louisiana Purchase, but the Mexican Cession. You may remember that the Mexican Cession was um, uh, the result of our war on Mexico and a number of people who were concerned about the spread of slavery opposed the war in Mexico because they felt that some of the areas, we, they thought that we would certainly acquire territory if we were successful in the Mexican War, which we did, and that that territory might be amenable for slavery. And so since the major issue of the 1850s, is the interaction of slavery with westward expansion, the Mexican War was a controversial um, episode. But by 1866, that's settled. Um, there is not going to be slavery in the territories. And the territories have been acquired and they're opening up. Uh, and so ranch life begins as part of this process. There are also some other features of the process that are not portrayed in the so-called cowboy myth works. Um, w one of them is the dispossession, um, the displacement, uh, and the, the forcible removal of Native American tribes. When the Mexican secession is acquired, and indeed when the Louisiana purchase before it is acquired, most of the inhabitants of the territory that becomes the United States uh, are Native American tribes. And little by little they are driven um, from routes that settlers covet uh, onto reservations and, and sometimes with the, um, through armed expeditions. So Part of the first step in establishing ranching is the dispersal of the tribes that inhabited the areas. The, the next step is the discovery that longhorn cattle, which had become popular um, for livestock in, in the Texas area, in the southwest, are capable of enduring the uh, northern plains winters. And so it's possible to move herds north into the area of the Trans-Mississippi West. Um, but because the land is arid in a fashion that it's not in the uh, east of the um, Mississippi River, um, because the land is arid, the character of farming has to take different shape. And so instead of large-scale farming with, with plentiful access to water, we get ranching, which, is, which you can do in an arid area. So once you get ranching and once you get the displacement of American tribes, um, 
you create a need on at, at ranches and enterprise. You cr create a need for people to work on ranches, to herd cattle, and that's how the ranch hand emerges. And a cowboy is really a hired ranch hand. And cowboys are overwhelmingly young males. And they are, at this point, in the 1870s, many of them are Civil War, former participants in the Civil War. Some of them are deserters from both the Union and, and Confederate sides. Others are people who, for domestic reasons, decided that they didn't want to be accountable to the jurisdictions in which they lived, and so they lit out for the territory, um, forming, the, forming the basis of cowboy. Cowboys are um, quite, um, in contrast to the idea of living su sufficiently on the range, uh, cowboys uh, come into town and, and stock up on provisions that are paid for by the people that hire them. Um, they, they go out and they stay with the cattle. Um, there is no particular evidence that they um, are, uh, to the extent that there are, are records from cowboys describing their experiences, uh, it, it seems to be far from heroic. Um, and, um, and so their life, the, the, the life of a cowboy, um, is, is quite in contrast to the, to the myth. And finally, there's another development that goes on and is, is extremely important in who fashions the myth. Um, right before, right after Theodore Roosevelt publishes a, a, uh, a book on the Naval War of 1812, which he'd started as an undergraduate at Harvard College, um, the uh, same publisher that publishes that book publishes a book um, on the Northern and Pacific Railroad. Uh, and the Northern and Pacific Railroad first begins to extend its um, radius into Dakota Territory in the early 1880s, and Roosevelt gets extremely enthusiastic about riding out on the railroad. And the reason he wants to ride out on the railroad and go into Dakota Territory is because he wants to shoot big game. Um, he, isn't, he feels that the big game isn't going to be available anymore in the East, and, and he wants to get out and get, a, uh, get, a, get trophies uh, uh, while they're still there. So he becomes one of the early representatives of affluent Easterners who ride out on trains on hunting expeditions. As the railroad gets established, um, the railroad cultivates this sort of clientele. And resorts spring up along the, the, the lines um, from, um, from the East Coast cities to Chicago and West. And people go out on expeditions and shoot or hunt and stay briefly and then come back. And it is this group of people that fashions, that ends up fashioning the myth. Um, one of the interesting features of the um, principal contributors to this myth fashioning is that they all have contacts with Eastern publishers. Um, and some of their ventures are actually commissioned in advance. Roosevelt's Ranch Life in the Hunting Trail is commissioned. Um, he, he's actually making a living being a popular author at this point. Frederick Remington, who originally goes out himself, uh, comes into uh, a, a New York office with some illustrations and from then on the, the, uh, the, the magazine uh, commissions Remington to go out and paint. And connections are drawn between Roosevelt's books and Remington's paintings. Um, Owen Wister uh, has a career as a, an Eastern novelist, relatively unsuccessful career, um, but ends up going out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, and there develops the idea of, of uh, writing, becoming a, a, a writing of, on, on the cowboy and, and his life. Um, and and Worcester writes The Virginian when he's living in Savannah, Georgia. 
um, and, and turns the Virginian into a kind of uh, amalgamation of northern and southern romantic uh, chivalric figures. So th this is a, um, th th this is a um, depiction of a slice of American life that is significantly at odds with the experience of that life by the residents of it and the full-time, those who full-time uh, are full-time inhabitants of the Trans-Mississippi West. Uh, and yet it becomes the basis for uh, a kind of conception of the West, the, the Wild West, if you will, um, that uh, becomes extremely popular. And so Roosevelt is actually able to identify himself uh, as a cowboy, as a political figure. Um, he, if one thinks about Roosevelt's political career, he really is a, uh, what I would call a, a gentry reformer. He, he's interested in, in politics in New York State at a time when the uh, municipal politics has been taken over by patronage and by urban machines such as Boss Tweed. And Roosevelt is one of an unusual uh, um, number of his social contemporaries, mugwumps, if you will, who consider re-entering politics to clean it up, uh, to, to, um, to um, uh, serve as a counterweight to the urban machines that are based on uh, large numbers of immigrants, uh, to uh, replace corruption with good government. Uh, and although Roosevelt is in many respects in the 1880s a conventional Republican politician, he's always on the, the gentry reform side. Now, in that sense, his romanticization of the West goes hand in hand with his political goals in the East because both can be seen as critiques of commercial, industrial, uh, patronage-dominated, immigrant-influenced uh, civilization that's grown up in urban and industrial centers in the East. So, Although Roosevelt doesn't self-consciously link this up uh, in a programmatic fashion, he does link it up in, a, in a, what might be called a kind of mass appeal. He presents himself simultaneously uh, as a gentleman reformer and as a cowboy. Um, now the, the cowboy part doesn't really take shape um, in politics until the Rough Riders episode. And th this introduces another theme um, that is part of one of the puzzles uh, that when, when one encounters this literature for the first time, uh, one is confronted with. And that is, why is there so much emphasis among the writers on how this experience in the West adds to one's sense of masculinity. Why, is, why are people talking about how going out West makes one a real man? Uh, or going out, going out West uh, um, is, is a, as, as uh, Remington put it, the, the beat of hardy life. Uh, and and the experiences of the West are pictured as often physical trials in which one shows one's physical prowess as a man. Why is, why is there so much of that? Why does um, the Congregationalist magazine, in reviewing Roosevelt's The Wilderness Hunter in 1893, say the following. The Wilderness Hunter, by the way, for those of you who don't know it, is, is, is another 
collection of short story uh, short stories there some of them may be in fact stories uh, 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 episodes um, uh, accounts of adventures that Roosevelt had shooting game and and uh, and living in on, in ranch territory it's very much like ranch life in the hunting trail and and here's what the Congregationalist magazine says the man of social position and culture who can tramp for days at a time in the uninhabited mountains, sleeping in the open air and depending for food solely upon his rifle, sets an example of simple, wholesome living which is of high value in counteracting the tendency toward effeminateness so prevalent upon many of the young men of the present. So, look what's linked together in that excerpt. First of all, the man is a man of social position and culture. But, notwithstanding that, he can tramp for days at a time in the uninhabited mountains and sleep in the open air and depend for food solely on his rifle. And in doing that, he sets an example of simple, wholesome living. And that example is of high value. Why? Because it counteracts the tendency toward effeminateness, so prevalent among many of the young men of the present. So what you have here is a kind of uh, rebel act by someone of social privilege living in the midst of effeminate corruption in the East who strikes out for himself and, and shoots game with his rifle and lives in the open air and therefore sets a wholesome example. Um, now, why, it, why especially because it's very unlikely that many of these people of social position and privilege did that. Basically they went out and hired people to help them shoot game and got trophies and came back and displayed them in metropolitan clubs or houses. Um, so why does Congregationalist, which has no particular um, dog in this fight, I mean, why do they capture this particular image? Well at this point it looks as if what's going on is that the idea of going west in this fashion, the idea of the cowboy and living the cowboy experience, uh, has gotten connected up to a, a sense of unease uh, and disquiet and maybe critique that's emerging um, alongside living in an industrializing and urbanizing uh, east and, and and uh, Midwest cities. That somehow this experience is, is, is being portrayed as, a, as an escape from this. Now at this point the time frame, the 1880s to the, to the early 20th century becomes relevant because what, what's going on in, in this period? Well first of all the Civil War is over and there's an attempt to reconcile North and South by sort of bringing back, um, by, by bringing back Southerners into the Union. Uh, the, uh, the election of 1876 has settled the issue of Reconstruction. Um, we're, we're beginning, we're, we're uh, for the first time uh, a justice from the South is named to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, Woodrow Wilson will be a Southern president. And so there's a sort of reintegration of, of North and South. And, North and so Northerners and Southerners are in a sense both invited to consider what it's like to develop this new United States, the Trans-Mississippi West out to the Pacific Coast. So there's both sides then have a stake in this and the experience seems to be one in which everybody can share. Now what exactly is that experience? By the late 
uh, 1890s, the frontier, the so-called frontier, uh, is closing. By that is meant that as the territory, uh, federal territories become developed, uh, there's fewer and fewer land areas that are described of as um, unsettled um, or unoccupied, meaning that there's still largely uh, areas in which uh, uh, American Indian tribes exist that are not allocated under reservations. So the, the idea of people occupying a space in between civilization and the frontier is vanishing. Um, and so this mythic space that the cowboy occupies uh, becomes elevated, becomes uh, simultaneously nostalgic uh, and, and romantic. Um, in addition, the, the um, historical representation of the actual process of how Americans went west from the 1780s on is beginning to be fashioned. And indeed, Roosevelt will be one of the fashioners in his multi-volume series of winning of the winning of the West. So the, the winning of the West, going West, comes to be depicted as a kind of universalistic ritual of how, of how American society has progressed from East to West, from frontier to civilization, conquering space, building institutions like the railroad to help, and the telegraph to help conquer that space, turning vacant, by vacant meaning occupied by Native American tribes, land into profitable enterprises such as ranching. And so it becomes a kind of elemental American experience. So you appeal to sort of the, the you appeal to a process that many Americans can look back to and say, well, that really is what developing America was all about. And at the same time, you ingest it with this idea of, of uh, a, a romantic escape from the East. Now, how does masculinity factor in? With the end of the Civil War is the end of the last armed conflict in which young males growing up can participate. Roosevelt is born too late to fight in the Civil War. Um, and there is no war for the United States for another more than 30 years. And, and so a group of young um, male Americans whose fathers and whose grandfathers had the experience of fighting in a war are deprived of that option. Um, and so Roosevelt, um, when when we have a, a relatively minor skirmish with Spain, um, which is escalated primarily by the United States into the Spanish-American War, Roosevelt just can't wait to fight. Um, he's been wanting to fight um, ever since he went to the Badlands. Um, somehow he's been wanting to have the experience. Now his, his father, did not serve in the Civil War, but bought a substitute. One could still do that, and many um, Americans with means did it. Um, but you have, at, at one point, um, over, um, there's one statistic from Philadelphia that is particularly uh, remarkable. Um, notwithstanding the, the uh, buying of substitutes, half the uh, adult population between the ages of 18 and 45 in the city of Philadelphia was uh, participating in the Civil War. So this is a, 
experience that so many of Roosevelt's age contemporaries have had. Their fathers participated or at least were affected by it. They didn't get the opportunity. So uh, it, it's somehow as if they need another experience to demonstrate their virility. Um, and so they escalate this idea of going out west and shooting game uh, and, and living off the land and acting as if they were a cowboy uh, into that. Um, so it, it's, it's a fascinating episode in, um, the, in American cultural history where um, a group of uh, publicists craft a particular image which leaves out most of the significance of what's actually going on in the ranch experience of the Trans-Mississippi West, creates another image, the image of displacing Indians and building railroads and, and bringing cattle up for, from Texas to, to the plains, uh, it is largely ignored. And in its place is put this romantic portrait of cowboy life. And it is the romantic portrait of cowboy life that has endured. Now, why is that? Um, wh why is this sort of affinity for the Wild West genre? Well, I, again, I think we have to go back to the fact that for so many of American families, part of their heritage is the movement of their family from east to west, either from Europe as immigrants settling um, or from staking out a claim initially in the east and moving west and moving further west, um, and, and what that has um, meant over time. So when you see portraits that glamorize and dramatize the experience of doing that, and at the same time, um, experiences, experiencing the kind of older vision of American, of a wilderness society populated by uh, strange beings uh, where one had to forage off the land. Uh, it, it is uh, an overwhelmingly attractive vision for readers who are, for the most part, not experiencing it. Uh, so. In the end, it's, it's, it all starts, the idea of the Western as special and having cultural significance that the other regional genres don't, all starts with this particular episode. And the fascinating thing about it for me it is that the people who fashion it uh, and, and the people who communicate messages that have cultural resonance are not the people who actu accurately observe what's going on. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. We're just about out of time and we want to catch up with me. Let's take nine or ten minutes for questions. I have, I have one that was sort of, I think, implicit in something you said. So the Civil War is this cataclysmic national event in the mid-century and in binding the North and South back together culturally by creating, is it, is it true that by developing this myth of the cowboy it leaves out the actual reality of the westward movement which was a prolonged struggle over the advancement of slavery. You've, you've sort of replaced the narrative with a much more agreeable one. Yeah, the, the, the Virginian in, in Owen Wister's novel n never talks about that, n never talks about the, the st I mean, the, it, 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 it may be misunderstood or not fully appreciated by histories of, um, popular histories of the Civil War, how the crucial concern of when the, when North and South were deteriorating in the 1840s and 50s, the crucial concern was not with slavery, but with the expansion of slavery. 
Because slavery changed from a position where it was expected to die out to a position after our purchase of Louisiana where it was expected to flourish in some regions. And so all of a sudden, North and South is confronted with, not this, well, this is maybe a slightly embarrassing, but um, after all, awkward and, 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 and uh, temporally um, contingent uh, experiment to one that could, could continue to define America into the 20th century. And so that issue, not so much slavery itself, is what makes who settles these territories so fraught. And, and basically the political parties uh, cannot solve the issue and that's why, in effect, we, the, there's a breakdown and we have the Civil War. After that is removed, it's kind of like there's a release. And, so, and, and we can forget, ultimately. And by the 1880s, people are making a big effort to forget. There's a kind of uh, a rehabilitation uh, of Southerners. And, and the cowboy, in, a, in an indirect way, the cowboy uh, myth literature is part of that. That's cool. Question, yes, here. Uh, you talked about a lot of these factors almost coming together as a perfect storm, I think, the myth of the cowboy doesn't take hold. Uh, in America, but what about um, looking back at the magazines at the time, seeing the cartoons and seeing the articles of the century and Harper's and Scribner's uh, commission? Um, they sent writers and artists out to this area to do stories, but there were also stories, uh, hedgeographic almost, about missionaries and gold prospectors and uh, soldiers, of course, and others. To what extent do you think uh, it was just a coincidence that these three Ivy League people, uh, Roosevelt the celebrity, Whisper the writer, and Remington the artist, sort of sold the deal. For instance, if Matty Bruce had been an illustrated novel, maybe we'd all be ready. Yeah, let me just quickly try to paraphrase that. There are competing other narratives that could have been assumed as the central myth of the West, uh, gold seeking and so on. Why did this one compete with those in so effective a fashion? Well, of course, you can't be, you can't be Natty Bumpo um, in North Dakota because it's too arid. N Natty Bumpo is a hunter and a trapper and a, and a tracker. Um, and I, I think aridity is part of the story. Um, I, I think the, 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 one of the reasons that cowboys become so fascinating is because for many Easterners, going out and seeing this landscape is exotic. And they just think, it's not like seeing the woods in the Adirondacks or the woods in, in uh, southeast Georgia. Th this is a different sort of landscape and it's much harder to live on. At least it's perceived as much harder to live on. So you have to be much more of a man to survive this inhospitable climate. Something I can understand after coming to this. <laughs> Careful now. Here. Could this also be seen as a way to sort of Americanize, you know, a lot of the cultural uh, uh, archetypes, like you know, the knights errant, uh, you know, the cattle raids, and the Irish cattle raid stories, um, uh, things like that, that uh, you know, that were, you know that, that come up with an American version of you know the, the, the same kind of stories that you know were long told in Europe, that we, you know fit into an American that Europe. It really was very, very much different from Europe. The West had not nothing. In Europe. Yeah, it's the Connecticut Yankee question. I mean, is this a way to Americanize popular stories from the European tradition? You, you know, I, I, I've done some work on Holmes, and one of the fascinating things I found out about when Holmes went to the civil went into the Civil War, he enlisted. He was a very enthusiastic participant, um, and then he gets wounded three times, and and he thinks about leaving, and he writes a letter to one of his friends, and he says, if if I didn't think that this war was part of the great chivalric crusade for mankind, I would think twice about staying in. Um, and he and his Harvard contemporaries think of themselves as a species of knights going out to do battle. 
So in a way, this is a kind of revival of it, revival of that sort of chivalry. The, the, again, the Virginian is an emblematic figure. He's, he's got all the chivalric virtues. He's, he's loyal to women and, and he, he does battle for their cause. Um, he's honest and upright and true. Uh, and and uh, so that's drawing on a myth, but it's fashioning it in a distinct way. Am I missing one? Yes? Mr. White, um, I'm so glad you said what you just said because I was sure you were going to pick on Odysseus and say that he didn't get home and it was all made up and that the Trojan War got won by the Persians or something instead. But I do want you to know, sitting next to a gentleman who probably is a knight, that it's true about Teddy Roosevelt coming out west. I came only from Bismarck and I was, two years before that, I nearly died, nothing wrong with me. Then I got seriously ill, and my attorney said, oh, there's so many complications. I said, I'm not ready to move to Canada or Minnesota. I came to Dickinson, and you know what? Look at me. I, I'm absolutely in excellent health. I'm nice to <laughs> And there are all these fine men around, and it's all true. Nita, <laughs> thank you. Um, a, a personal memoir restored by the West. That, that could be just natural selection, of course. <laughs> Let me ask you one last question. I'm so tempted to get into Jefferson. You're at Mr. Jefferson's University. I'd love to know what he would have thought of all of this, but let me ask you a different sort of question. You know, you, you didn't have time to go into too much about Remington and Worcester and exactly the way in which they fashioned this mythos, but we know that it happened and we're the beneficiaries of it. It didn't happen instantly. I mean, Mark Hanna could say that damned cowboy is now the president of this country. To what extent did they know what they were creating? Yeah. You know, I, I, there was a, we've had several discussions about Roosevelt's self-consciousness. I, I really don't think he's a, he was a very self-conscious person. Um, I, I think he was a strategic politician and certainly aware of the publicity angles, but I, I don't think he thinks this is, <laughs> is a mythic at all. Um, he may dress up as a cowboy for political reasons, but I think he thinks his portraits of the West are true. Uh, and that's the way it really was. And I, I, mean, he, I think he thinks that he got better for being in Dakota, and he undoubtedly did get better. Um, but whether that was um, going to be true across the board for all people who read Roosevelt was perhaps another matter. Let me just say, and, and I wish we had more time, but you'll be able to talk with uh, Mr. White at lunch and later. Unfortunately, uh, the book, The Eastern Establishment and the Western Experience, is not here, but there's a sign-up form out at the bookstall, and you can sign up for it, and the book will be sent to you. But your short book on Oliver Wendell Holmes is here, and you'd be happy to sign it, I'm sure. Sure. Thank you very much for that great lecture. Thanks.